the problem is that I think we've engineered a society, and I, you know, you've talked about this with automation and so on, where it's getting easier and easier and easier to have more layers of psychological distance between people who are affecting your life and you. And the evidence is very, very clear that the more psychological distance between one person and another, the easier it is to abuse them, to view them as disposable, to start to treat them you know, like they're insignificant. And, you know, you think about the corporate downsizing consultant, the person who sort of got the job of just coming in to fire you because nobody in the corporate, you know, corner office actually wants to deal with that. And, you know, I think, I think we've created a world that is built for psychological distance. Uh, even things like drone strikes, you know, uh, I mean, dr drone strikes create psychological distance more than- Dude, uh, social media, life. like people behave social on media. social media in a way they never would in real life. You know, yeah, I mean, I always, I always think about that when I get like these hateful comments on my, on my Twitter. I'm like, nobody has ever said something like this to me in person. And like, you get this like that, 12 that, times that's a day. Why, I, you know, that's why I'm really pleasant on social media and then I'm a total dick in real life. Like it gets you in person. <laughs> I'm going to be like, I'm going to tell you things you have never heard before <laughs> to your face. And then on social media, I'm like, you know, like, keep going. <laughs> I mean, I'm kidding. But, uh, but, but when you talk about the psychological distance, uh, th this is actually one of, like, the grave dangers of our – there's so many grave dangers of our time. I mean, we're, we're pretty fucked. But, the, um, <laughs> but, but that there's this erosion of sympathy and empathy. Um, and, and then there are these, I'm going to say it, like, kind of performative displays of sympathy and empathy that I don't think uh, amount to the real thing. It's like, you know, uh, like you're, if, if you have a choice between helping someone in real life or like proclaiming on social media how much you give a shit, like tell the world how much I care as opposed to, you know, you actually tell someone you care is like go out and like do something about it and no one will ever know you did anything about it. That'd be a more genuine expression. This week on Forward, political science professor and author of the new book, Corruptible, Who Gets Power and How It Changes Us, Brian Class talks about how we can actually build a system that brings in the people we want and gets rid of the corruption that unfortunately is becoming widespread. Brian Class, this week on Forward. Hello and welcome to the Forward Podcast, someone who wrote an entire book on a subject that's near and dear to my heart. That book is Corruptible, Who Gets Power and How It Changes Us. Political scientist, host of the aptly named Power Corrupts Podcast, Brian Class. Brian, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So Brian, uh, how long have you been super powerful and how long did it take you to have your soul corrupted and become very, very dark? Well, <laughs> I don't think that I'm uh, super powerful myself. I mean, I have a, a, a bit more of a a bit more of a platform than I once did, uh, which I still find very weird. I mean, I, I find it very weird to be speaking to you, to be honest, because <laughs> you're a, an ultra famous and accomplished person. But, uh, but I think this is one of those, one of those things where I've been studying really powerful people for the better part of a decade. And, and what I started doing was, um, you know, I sat down with various former despots and, and war criminals and so on in wow. my early research. And, uh, I started to wonder, the, the germination of this book was, I started to wonder, you know, what is this like at the more like normal level? What Are these dynamics, are these kinds of people also experiencing the same things in their head when they're, you know, in, in charge of a local homeowners association or running for president or doing things a bit more close to home? So the book is trying to sort of understand power in all of its nuance and complexity and, and how it changes people and affects them and who seeks it and all of that. Well, you, you clearly have a very deep interest in the subject because not only did you write a book, but your podcast is literally named <laughs> after this. So, um, so tell us a little bit about how you came to this. It seems you studied political science. So is that when this interest kicked in? And then how do you make a career out of this? Because I'm sure people would love to hear about that. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I, when I explain what I do to people, uh, what, what, what I do in terms of like what my professional life is like, I say I study bad people who do bad things. And that's typically, you know, the sort of through line in a lot of my research. 
So I started traveling around the world and, and, and studying these people, talking to them, having breakfast with them, uh, sometimes, you know, drinking a beer with them, whatever it was. And what was really fascinating to me is that there's there's this sort of weird thing that happens to you when you sit down with someone who's, you know, a corrupt kingpin in Madagascar and you start to sort of like them. You know, I think there's something to Are they that. Charming? Where, yeah, they're 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 charming, they're funny, they have complexity and nuances to them. Wow. And and you sort of, you know, what I started to to think about was how can I convey that there's this disconnect between like my moral judgments of some of these people and then also like my understanding of why they exist the way they do? Because I think I think one of the things that we often do in politics is we just sort of say, what's wrong with the leaders we have? And we're not thinking about some of the other components of this. Like, throw the bums out, you know, Brian, throw the bums out. <laughs> Well, you and I agree on that. I mean, you and I agree that there's a lot of problems with the uh, oh, wow. with the current crop of leaders. But well, but I would no, say no, no, no. I'm I'm going to follow up with this, Brian. Is that like I'm joking about it because uh, I am profoundly in agreement with what Ezra Klein wrote, which is that corrupt systems compromise good individuals with ease, uh, and we keep having this fantasy that like oh, if only I could get that one moral person in there, then everything will be well. And there are various both candidates and uh, political movements and media organizations that have reinforced that myth that I, I believe is a myth. It's like, hey, guess what? You could get a relatively moral person into a corruptive system and the system's going to win. Like, like that, that person's not going to show up and all of a sudden the pipes are, are going to become squeaky clean. Yeah, you know, I so I started with this question of like, does power corrupt or, or do corruptible people seek power? And I think the answer is definitely both. And I think you're completely right about this because – we often have these little quips. I mean, the power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely line has been said to me hundreds of times in my career. And what I always say back is, yeah, that's just the very, very scratching the surface of this story. It's a much more complicated picture because we ignore the systems. There's there's a perfect study, I think, that that really captures this, where they these economists took uh, students and they had them roll a dice 42 times. And then they said, every time you get a six, we're going to give you some money but you get to report how many sixes you have rolled so you can lie. Now, using statistical methods, they could figure out who was lying and who was telling the truth. And when they did this study in India, where the system is pretty unclean in terms of bribery and, and sort of kickbacks and so on, the students who lied disproportionately wanted to go into the civil service. They wanted to extract the bribes. When they did the exact same study in Denmark, where the, the bureaucracy is notoriously clean, it was inverted. All of the students who told the truth were the ones who wanted to go into civil service and public service. What was it in the States, bro? What was it in the States? <laughs> they didn't do it in the States, I know, but but I think I think we know the answer of what that would be, right? I mean, I think I don't, I don't think it takes a huge logical <laughs> leap to imagine uh, that this would be a very bad finding in the US. And and I I think what what I was trying to do in the book was to say, okay, look. We accept that power corrupts people. It turns them worse. We accept that worse people are disproportionately drawn to power for the wrong reasons. What are we going to do about it? You know, I think the answer is you have to engineer systems to counteract these tendencies that seem to be relatively immutable, that we have designed systems by accident that attract and promote all of the wrong kinds of people to the highest echelons of our society. And I think that's a massive mistake where we haven't debated how we actually change the system itself. I love it. Uh, that's why I enjoyed both your thinking and your book immensely. And one thing that your book did in spades is provide solutions or suggestions for solutions. You're like, how can you actually solve this problem? And listeners to this podcast know that one pet peeve of mine is that we don't do that. Where you, you'll read a book and they'll scare the shit out of you with a very thorny problem. You'll be 90% in and then you'll be like, how do we fix it? How do we fix it? And then the solutions are generally so tepid and half-assed and uh, you know, like kind of throw your hands up and hand wavy that I, I very often just, you know, like literally throw the book down in disgust. Uh, do I do that in real life? You know, in my head, yes, I do. I, I'm not really a book thrower. But um, in your case, your book actually dug into the solutions with very, very real, concrete suggestions. So first, let's set up the problem a little bit more, and then we'll go into your solutions, which I enjoyed a great deal and agreed with just about all of them. Um, so first, let's set the stage about the corruptive nature of power, which most people kind of accept. 
Uh, if you've read my stuff, listener, if you haven't, you should go out and buy it now. Uh, but if you <laughs> if you uh, pay attention to my stuff, like I I, ha- I wrote an excerpt that uh, it sounds like you saw in Politico uh, about how running for office tends to screw you up. Now you're suggesting that screwed up people run for office more often, which I I will say is consistent with my experience. Um, you. Uh, you will see people who do run for office for the right reason, and they're very, very striking because you're like, wow, this person is actually genuine. And you're like, oh, I really want to help this person. Like, like that, that person does exist. Um, I'm going to say that person is actually like a significant proportion of the candidates that I've met and supported. Um, but, you know, like uh, of the myriad people who run for office are a lot of them folks who just want a little slice of power or like a, like a you know, better role or better gig or have to boss people around and the, and the rest of it? Sure. <laughs> is, that, is that what the data shows as well? Yeah, you know, I think I think this is something where we have quite a lot of evidence to suggest that the wrong kinds of people are, are drawn to power. And, and I think when we think about why that is, it's not actually that difficult to understand. I mean, it's, you, you think about like a high school basketball team tryout, right? There's going to be not a representative sample of people at that tryout. There's going to be taller kids than usual, uh, you know, going out for the team. The same is true for power. P- people who are power hungry or who view power as an obsession, for which I mean sometimes psychopaths, Machiavellian uh, individuals, narcissistic individuals, you know, for them, it's like moths to a flame. They're really, really attracted to it. And also they're really good at getting it. I mean, this is one of the dangerous aspects of it is that we've set up systems and some of this is unavoidable potentially in politics, but also in business is that, you know, you have a very superficial assessment of someone. So like the job interview, it's a 45 minute format where you're trying to make people like you. I mean, if you're a psychopathic, chameleon-like, Machiavellian narcissist, it's the perfect stage for you to sort of show up, impress people, and and get the job. And of course, the same is true for promotions and so on. And one thing I imagine, I mean, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you say about this, but one of the really strange things about electoral politics is there's loads of people who have opinions about you, but they don't know you, right? And you have to sort of win them over in these little snapshots of a 30-second conversation or a 10-minute debate answer. Well, 10-minute debate, you know. The, One-minute debate the answer, time. but continue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But, you know, my, my, my point is that you have these little snapshots when we're, and we're supposed to assess, like, is this a good person? Is this a bad person? Are they honest? Are they trustworthy? But then the thing that really resonated about that that excerpt from your book that I think is so so refreshing to actually see somebody write about this from the first person is that you know your experiences were were strange no, most people don't walk into these rooms full of cheering people on a daily basis but also it's not just psychological it actually changes your brain chemistry i mean this is one of the things i found really interesting uh, in researching the book and i was trying to get you know evidence from wherever i could get it so one of the guys i talked to is uh, somebody who studies monkeys and he has like a DEA class two license and he's got, you know, pure cut cocaine in a safe in his, in his office basically. And uh, he takes these monkeys and they're all individually housed. So they're not in any sort of social hierarchy. Then he puts them in groups of four and like immediately it goes one, two, three, four. You can tell who the top monkey is, who the bottom monkey is and so on. And uh, then they put them in a chair and they can either pull a lever to get some banana pellets or they can pull a lever and get intravenous cocaine into their bloodstream. And all the dominant monkeys take the pellets and all of the subordinate monkeys take the cocaine. And then when they open up the brains later on and they scan them, the dopamine receptors have changed. And you know, it's actually fundamentally shifted their brain chemistry. So I think you know, the story of power corrupts is this little, you know, it's like this thing you can, trot can, out at a cocktail party. Can you explain party, why the powerful, confident monkey chooses the banana pellets over the cocaine? What'd you say? Like, why does the powerful alpha monkey opt for the banana pellets uh, over the cocaine? Yeah, so the idea here is that there's not, there's not a sort of stress response from being in a position of authority. You sort of are getting many of your needs met. They're more chilled out. The food is They're more like, chilled. oh, okay, like, uh, you know, just hit, hit, I'm pretty straight. Just give me some banana pellets. Whereas the, the junior subordinate monkeys are so stressed out. They're like, I need drugs. <laughs> is, is, is that yeah. right? That's that's exactly right. But the the, the good news uh, the good news though for people who are obsessed with power and may not have have obtained it uh, is that actually being at the top of the hierarchy can be bad for you too. So I mean this is another area where I, I looked at both 
evidence from non-human primates and also from you know, human society. And when they look at baboons, they can study uh, with this process called DNA methylation, how fast the actual baboon is aging on a genetic basis, like a biological basis, as opposed to, you know, on a calendar basis. And what they found is at the very bottom of the hierarchy, the baboon aged very quickly. It was stressed. It didn't have resources. It didn't have mates. As you went up the hierarchy, it got better until you hit the alpha position. And then it was extremely stressful. And that that baboon actually aged by far the fastest or much, much faster than it would have had it been near the top, but not actually at the apex. And we've, we've seen this with uh, presidents as well. There's a study of two. Oh, everyone years. knows about the aging of the presidents, but continue. What yeah, does the, the data it's, say? It's, it's worse than, it's worse than even the appearances of the gray hair because there are over 200 years in 17 countries. They tracked the winner of an election versus a, a candidate who lost the election. And the average, president who won, and this is you know, across 17 countries, died 4.4 years sooner than the people who lost. So uh, you, you may have not won the presidency, Andrew, but you, you might live for four and a half years longer than some of these other people. So that's always good. Yes, I won anyway. <laughs> that's right, Brian. That's what a power mad person would say. All right, y'all, it's 2022, and it's time to get serious about your data and internet privacy and security. And that's why we use ExpressVPN, because odds are, if you're not using ExpressVPN, it's like going to the bathroom and just leaving the door open. It's like doing something private, but letting the world freaking see it. And that's why we use ExpressVPN, because it, it's closing the freaking door when you should be closing the freaking door. So these internet service providers that you use all the time, they know every single website you visit and they can sell this info to ad companies and tech giants and use your data to target you over and over and over. But ExpressVPN puts a stop to this. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that your online activity can't be seen by anyone. It's great. I use ExpressVPN on all my devices. I use it on my iPhone. I use it on my Mac. You can use it on routers. It's awesome. It's, and the best part about it is like plug and play. Just download the app. Bang, you're in. ExpressVPN, super simple. And it's the number one rated VPN by Mashable, The Verge, and a bunch of other outlets. So here's what I want you to do. If you're like me, you think people should go to the bathroom in private <laughs> uh, and believe your online activity is your business, secure yourself by visiting expressvpn.com slash yang today. Use our exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash yang, and you can get an extra three months free, which is an awesome deal. So that's expressvpn.com slash yang. Protect your data. Do it the right way. Get ExpressVPN. I, I will suggest that there is a native mistrust of people. I, you know, what happened with me when I, I decided to run for president, I think a lot of people were like, who the fuck is this guy? And then it, it was like, hey, is he crazy? Uh, is he uh, a narcissist? Is he the rest of it? And then after they started eliminating some of these possibilities, they were like, oh, wait, maybe this person actually just wants to give me a thousand bucks a month. They're like, it is genuine or the rest of it. But we come to the table with a ton of mistrust. Like you have to somehow walk through someone's doubts and skepticism because we're kind of conditioned to think if you are doing something like run for office and you're probably an asshole uh, or, or uh, you know, like really into yourself. Um, so it's very stressful to be at the top. I think most people will understand that natively because you see the president's age. There is that proverb, heavy lies the crown. Um, and one of the things you say in your book is like, maybe you want to be second. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe you'd like to be the person next to the, the leader. Yeah, you know, I, 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 think that's, I think that's right. I think it's the idea of sort of being in the court but not being the king. And, and I think that distrust is understandable, but I also think it's something where, you know, we can fix it. I, 
I, I have this sort of strange paradox in the sense that I've I've met some of the worst people on the planet. I mean, I've I've met war criminals and despots and torturers and all this, and yet I, I genuinely I genuinely believe that people are on balance good. And so I'm, I'm optimistic that if we tweak the system in the right way, uh, we can actually fix it. I, I wanted to give an example of this and how what you were talking about and sort of how the system affects the, the outcome so much is with policing, which is one of these massive, I mean, it's a massive debate. I, you, you had it in the New York City mayor's race and so on. And uh, what I started to do is I started to scour the internet to, to look at police departments and sort of how they recruit people. And I found this video from Doraville, Georgia, this little town of like 10,000 people outside of Atlanta. And the video is like, it's absurd. It's, it's, it flashes the Punisher logo, this guy who like, you know, tortures criminals, is like a vigilante and so on. And, uh, and then like these guys in a tank scream into view in camouflage and they, they, they throw smoke grenades out the tank and then the Punisher logo comes back and there's death metal music on it. And I'm like, if you just want to be like a community service cop, like you're never going to apply for that job, right? So... I then talked to the head of recruitment for New Zealand's police department, and they said, we know about this, which is why we spent a lot of money designing a different recruitment strategy. And they, they set up this video, it's gone viral in New Zealand, it's very funny. And basically it depicts policing completely differently. It starts with, you know, it's got a lot of uh, ethnic minority uh, cops who are underrepresented in the force, a lot of women and so on. They're chasing this unseen perpetrator. They stop to sort of dance in the street with an old man who's crossing the road. And then they get to the, uh, they get to the end and they've caught the perpetrator and it's a border collie who's stolen a woman's purse. And instead of the Punisher logo, it says, do you care enough to be a cop on the, on the screen, right? And, and it's like, what, what do you think happened? Well, the number of, of applicants shot up. The types of applicants were way more diverse than they were before. The relationship between the police and the public improved. The l levels of abuse declined. And it's like, you know, the way you portray this really matters. So when it comes to things like distrust in politicians, I mean, part of that is because the current crop of politicians has earned distrust. And so, you know, I think it's a, it's a chicken or the egg problem. To get better politicians, we need politics to look like a virtuous world. And at the same time, you know, we, we can't have it be a virtuous world unless we get better people into politics. Oh, yeah, it's tough. Uh, so there's this aging factor that you describe. One of the, the things that uh, I'm sure you also saw was around the death of sympathy uh, in the powerful, where your ability to empathize and re reciprocate emotion goes down. And that's an adaptive response because... Uh, if you're powerful, you don't need to waste your time mirroring someone else's emotions. <laughs> like it's an efficiency thing to be like, look, I don't care what's going on with you. I'm just going to tell you what to do. Yeah, you know, this is there's a chapter in the book called The Weight of Responsibility that that is, it's just haunted me. It's been lingering in my thoughts for for so long because what I did in the chapter is I, I, I juxtapose this guy, Ken Feinberg, who was in charge of the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund where he had to actually assign a dollar value to the people who died on 9-11. I mean, it's a horrible, horrible job. And he told me, look, every single day what I did is I went to the office, I met with the families, I heard their stories, and it was excruciating. It was awful. But if it wasn't awful, then I need to get out of this line of work because I don't understand the empathic aspect of this. So he forced himself to go through that. Now, Another person I interviewed who I juxtaposed with Feinberg is John Yu, who was the guy who wrote the, depending on your politics, torture memos or enhanced interrogation memos. And I asked him, I said, you know, I understand like your point of view on this, but did you lose sleep over it? Like, did this bother you? And he was just like, no, it was a legal question. Like, and I'm like, yeah, but, but like people were waterboarded because of your legal determination. Like, does that ever occur to you as like something you should think about more? And he's like, no, I just sort of moved on. Like it was a legal question and that was it. And I, and I thought to myself, you know, there's, there's what you're talking about, which is how people in power just sort of end up losing that empathic response over time. But there's also this choice that people can make to decide to actually confront themselves with the consequences of their actions. And I think that's something that we have to insist on more that like, you can't have people be an abstraction to you. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, when I saw you on the campaign trail and so on, it, this is something that's part of politics. You have to talk to people. And the more that you do that, the more that you understand, like, this isn't some game. This is actually people having their life chances determined. And I think the more that people 
are confronted by that, the more they're going to be a little bit more empathetic than they would have been uh, if they're just sort of in the in the in the palace, so to speak, uh, looking down on the little people. Yeah, it's one reason why I think we ask our political figures to show up to disasters and meet with people because it's like, look, we need to know that you feel that you understand. Uh, and there, there are times when, you know, I frankly, I've been I've been parts of lots of these occasions and there are times when you're like, OK, um, like I, I feel like I'm just playing a role. And then there are other times when you're like, oh, I'm really glad I'm here because I'm understanding this problem much better and I'm understanding the suffering. Um, I, I can say from experience, like I've had both of those feelings. Um, but uh, there, there's certainly something very important about not just starting to reduce everything to, uh, I guess, in John Yu's case, it was like a legal determination because there, there's someone at the other end. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm curious. Do you mind if I ask you a question about this? Because no, the, the thing that I'd be, yeah. So, I mean, what I find really interesting about this is when I've talked to, you know, as I said, I interviewed about 500 people for for this research. Where do I rate in terms of brain damage? No, I'm kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> believe me, believe me, you are you are uh, very different from a lot of these people I talked to. Uh, there was there was some pretty uh, pretty nefarious figures that were uh, on the interview list, so to speak. But what, what I wanted to ask is, you know, the, the thing that struck me about some of these people who didn't turn bad or turned, you know, managed to stay themselves, so to speak, is they had checks around them. They had somebody who actually they like had either delegated to or had told point blank like if i'm doing something keep stupid, me from being an asshole I'm, go ahead smack yeah, me like, around like tell me like did you did you have to sort of confront that where you're like it's it's time to have somebody you know maybe it's a family member or an advisor who's just like this isn't the andrew yang i used to know did, i mean did, did that ever come up in a conversation well i i joke all the time brian that uh you know i i can take direction because i'm married you know what I mean? Like if I came home and are you married? I, I don't know this about you. Yeah. Oh, then you know what I'm talking about. But if I came home and was like a, a consistent asshole, I think Evelyn would have like a, you know, very, very short um, uh, leash for that. <laughs> She'd be like, what the hell's wrong with you? Um, so, I, you know, there is that in the world. Um, I didn't have a, a staffer I'd assigned that role. It was like, hey, FYI, if you know, you see me becoming callous and um, a jerk, like, please, you know, have me spend some time with some, some folks that will remind me of my own humanity. Like, I, I didn't have that. But I, I will say that without someone like Evelyn in my life, I probably could have used someone like that. I think that there, so I, you know, I know people, and some of them have uh, families in their lives, and then some don't. And I think it's very, very tough on people who are doing certain kinds of work, like public facing work as an example. And then if you are on all day and projecting and emoting, and then you come home and there's nobody, <laughs> you know, that there's nobody for you to be off around, there's nobody for you uh, just to, you know, put on the sweatpants or whatever. Uh, I think that would derange one over time. And, and one point I'm going to make here is that, so it, it was, what's interesting is I, th I think a lot of politics is bullshit. Like a lot of it is theater and nonsense and the rest of it. But there is this desire for a political figure to have a family. It's like, mm -hmm. hey, if this person can come home to a family and, uh, you know, be a good partner and parent uh, and the rest of it, then they must not be all bad. Uh, and I, I will say that there's something to that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I completely get that. I mean, I think that's something where it's 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 a really strange but also understandable aspect of our politics because you're trying to use these shortcuts to try to figure out what kind of what kind of human being you are. You know what I mean? It's like uh, you've got to make a decision, as I say, and you don't have any real interaction with the people with the person on the ballot. So you use these little shortcuts that are, are supposed to be proxies for us. And sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Yeah. So in my case, it is Evelyn that, you know, keeps me human and I'm grateful for it every day because I do remember a time before Evelyn and it was tough. You know, you come home and be like, grr, why world? Why are you so lonely? Uh, so yeah, thank you, Evelyn. Thank you for putting up with me and all of uh, our adventures <laughs> the last several years.
So the, the solutions you suggest, um, I, I think that they, they start with something around this New Zealand cop story you spoke of, which is try to actively recruit the right people and screen out the wrong ones. <laughs> very, very reasonable. Yeah, you know, it's one of the things about, so I've got these 10 different principles and, and none of them are really rocket science. There's no like political science wizardry that you're gonna come up with that will like solve all these problems. I think the problem is no one's talking about how we fix this. Uh, the the recruitment thing I think is a very obvious aspect of it, but it's, it's important. It's that if you wait for a self-selection of people into power, if you wait for those who are power hungry to throw their hat in the ring, I mean, is it really a surprise that that's who you get as leaders and candidates and so on? And so I think you have to actively seek out people for whom power is actually a burden. I love it. Find some unwilling person being like, sorry, we really need you to do this. You're going to hate it. It's going to suck. <laughs> Please do it for all of our sakes. Well, there's that there's that there's this line from Douglas Adams, the uh, the author. He says, like, anybody who can be made president is auto anybody who can become president has automatically disqualified themselves from holding the job. And I think there's, there's a, a grain of truth to that sometimes. Yeah, well, I agree. But I think you know the 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 other aspect. One of the ones that I think is um, is worth considering. It's a it's one of my more outside the box ideas, but it'd be reasonably easy to actually implement if there was political will. Is this idea of creating like a shadow board in business and a shadow house of representatives in politics and so on, based on randomly selected individuals? So, you know, in in ancient Athens they had this thing called the claritarion, which like it was basically like a jury duty system. It randomly assigned people to the citizen assembly. And then they had to make decisions about Athens. Now, I don't think that's a very good idea in, in general because I think that politicians actually develop some level of expertise on certain aspects. So we probably don't want to just have a random assortment of people making all the calls. But I do think that for oversight and accountability, it would be really good. So if you had a randomly selected 435 Americans for the House of Representatives as a shadow house, and then you said, look, you, you get all the same testimony, same documents, same, same expert, experts, et cetera, and now you have to decide the same things the House is deciding, and you're going to do it publicly. You're going to make the sort of statements publicly. I think there'd be some divergence on these things. You uh, think? Whenever lobbyists get involved, <laughs> I think, you know, and I think it would be pretty obvious. And I think that would provide yep. this really important level of accountability and oversight to politicians where you'd say, like, look, we put 435, like, normal Americans together, and they, they came up with an infrastructure bill in, like, an hour, why is it taking us, you know, five years? Why is the why is it skewed where these districts get so much more money based on the relative power? You know, all of that stuff would be exposed in quite a clear way because I think you would have reasonable discussion in in that in that format. And you could have the same in business, by the way. I mean, you know, how many boards that oversee businesses actually understand what it's like to be an employee in that company? So you could have a, a shadow board that's randomly selected employees that are making similar determinations as the board. And they're not binding, but they actually would have to be publicly released. Brian Class, pro shadow government. That sounds very, very <laughs> sinister, Brian. <laughs> I don't know. I think... You've been corrupted, my friend. So, um, so there are a couple of things I want to say here. First, I completely agree that the process of running for office weeds out people that you would actually want in charge. And a couple of things I'm going to suggest in this direction. Uh, introverts. Introverts probably should be in charge of more things, but introverts would cringe at the idea of putting themselves out there every day and schmoozing it up and glad handing and asking for money and everything else. I will say that I started out as an introvert. Uh, I was a very nerdy kid. I won most pensive when I was five years old, which means I didn't <laughs> talk. And now you'd have to call me an ambivert, where I, I still think I'm naturally introverted, but I, I obviously now can uh, perform or, or turn it on in a particular way. So we need more introverts in charge. Uh, and we would need more people who, as you say, are unwilling or you know not as excited about the office. And... Uh, people who have different types of experiences, which brings me to what you're suggesting around this 435 average Americans. Those 435 average Americans would look so different from the House of Representatives. It is insane because members of Congress, what percentage are millionaires nowadays? Like, I think it's over 50 percent. Um, the average age is 59 in Congress. I think it's 64 in the Senate. Um, I'm pretty sure it's got to be like, you know, 70% dudes. <laughs> like it's, it's 
uh, certainly going to be much whiter than the population. Uh, older, whiter, richer, more male, uh, for sure. And so if you had 435 uh, average Americans, they'd be, got, like the average age in America is 38, so they'd be 20 years younger. <laughs> like, like, like that would just be a start, is they'd, they'd be, you know, from a completely different generation. Yeah, I mean it's 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 completely true, and I think that's important because I think it's 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 really valuable to have people in power who look like the the people they're governing. I mean, there's there's one study of or a, at least live like them too because they just don't have lots of money. But continue complete completely. I mean, completely to understand what it's like. There there was one study in India where they randomly assigned village leaders, and uh, some were women and some were men. And the next generation, the number of women in who had tried to become political leaders in the villages that had a female leader for the first time massively increased. I think there's something to that idea of seeing people who look like you in positions of power. I was inspired to run by the previous Asian president uh, who I looked up and said, <laughs> he could do well, it, know, I could do you, it too. No, go ahead. You, you, you joke about that, but I mean, quite honestly, I think that's going to be an effect that people will in, you know, in five years on a podcast, say, I saw Andrew Yang, you know, the good old Andrew um, Yang effect. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But the, but the introvert, the introvert point, I think is a really important one that's underappreciated. And it's, it's, I, I started to study, I was, you know, I, I did some very strange things in researching this book. And one of them was, I, I um, sipped wine with the daughter of a cannibalistic dictator. Uh, and I was trying to figure out, you know, how much of this is inherited, how much of the power thirst is uh, is inherited, which isn't a crazy idea because how much of it is inherited? Well, it's this is this, the great question. So uh, basically, we think there is a significant portion that is the thirst of power. There's genetic studies that have looked into this, right? And we know that in hyenas, dominance is inherited. In zebrafish, in mice, you can adjust genes and make a mouse either super dominant or super submissive and so on. So there's something to it in the animal kingdom. When they did a study trying to find a power gene in humans, they found one. Uh, and it, it was correlated to a pretty significant degree with people ending up in positions of leadership. But this is where the, the, the study, I think, falters, is they can't say whether that gene caused you to desire power or just made you better at getting power. So it may just be the gene that's good for like being affable and funny and charming and extroverted. And that's what's correlated. You know, we, we don't really know. So they did twin studies. They tried to, you know, compare uh, fraternal twins with identical twins and all that stuff. You know, I talked to the daughter of a cannibalistic dictator. She seems to have inherited the thirst for power a bit. Uh, wow. She actually gave me that answer uh, where she said, uh, the, the, the backstory is this guy took power in the 1970s in the Central African Republic and gen genuinely uh, he, he fed dissidents to crocodiles and served human flesh to one dignitary allegedly. So not a good guy. Uh, and, and his daughter, when I asked her, you know, do you have any desire to like change your name or are you thinking about running for office? You know, do you want to not be associated with this guy or do you want to sort of follow in his footsteps? She said, you know, I'm really proud of my last name and uh, I'm not ruling anything out when it comes to politics, which is like the classic answer when you're like definitely going to go for it. So, uh, yeah, I was I was a little worried about that. But but I think I think the end answer is yeah there's and then probably she closed the interview basis. by saying you look delicious <laughs> well i did I, yeah i mean it's i did i did uh, remark on the fact that she runs a tea room uh outside of paris currently and i was like i hope she's serving like you know not serving people with tea <laughs> but is instead serving people tea so you know it's uh but uh, yeah just, that was a weird that was a weird one <laughs> So you've already touched on several of the remedies you suggest for how we get better people into positions of power. So, so number one is try and recruit the right people and screen out the not so good ones. Number two um, is this shadow government you speak of, which I, I'm, I'm going to say I make a very, very similar suggestion that was from a guy named Lawrence Lessig, who you probably read his stuff because mm. he, you mm. know, he's one of the big thinkers in this space. Um, he, he termed it civic juries, which is you get a bunch of people that resemble 
a random cross section of the country and then you ask them what they would do. Yeah, which I think is a good idea. I, I agree. Now, I love lesson number three so much. And I, I'm actually going to suggest too that even number one, which is try and recruit good people, one way to do that would be to have public campaign financing. Um, because Definitely. one of the things that scares people yeah. off from running is no one wants to be like, hey, I'm now going to have to raise millions of dollars. Maybe I can't raise millions of dollars. Maybe I don't want to bug everyone I know for 50 bucks. Like, like there's something really jacked up about that process. Um, and, and so if you have public campaign financing, I think that you end up getting better people. I, I couldn't agree with that more because I think, you know, the way I explain this to people when I sort of think about how, what I found in my own research is, Okay, let's imagine you've got sort of two people. One, per one person wants to run for office or become powerful for the sake of power. They're power hungry. The other person just sort of wants to like serve their community or make the world a little bit better. They're both going to weigh it up, right? But the person who's power hungry is going to have so much uh, so much desire to obtain power that they'll say, oh, you know, if that means I have to raise some money or face some death threats or, you know, have my past sort of raked over, so be it. You know, I care about power enough. It's worth it. So I'm going to get through to the next stage. I'm going to run. The other person is just going to say it's not worth it. You know, there's, there's, there's actual costs, uh, especially in the U.S. political system. I think about, you know, school board members these days who are getting death threats for trying to implement public health guidance. You know, my, the, the reason I got interested in politics myself was my mom ran for the local school board. And, you know, her biggest issue at the time was like, a pay dispute. Now it's like, you know, my kids are going to get harassed. I might get death threats. I might have crazy people show up at my house and, and all just because I want to help the school, you know? It's a rational thing to be like, hey, is this worth it? Uh, it's tough. And you're, you're seeing it too. There's a story about how various members of Congress uh, back down from impeaching Trump because they were getting death threats. And it's like, well, let me think. Like, is this really worth threatening my parents, my, my family's safety and having to go into hiding? Uh, maybe. I don't know how I'm going to vote on this. Well, and, and I, think that's, I think that's one of the things where, again, you know, it's like, it's why these reform conversations are so important because, like, one of the places that I do a lot of field research in is, is Bangkok in Thailand. And it's a place where going into politics is genuinely extremely dangerous, right? If you get on the wrong side of the generals, you could end up you get exiled, potentially killed, you're going to lose all your money almost certainly. Uh, and so when I talk to like, you know, young up and coming smart, you know, university graduates who are just sort of starting on their careers in Bangkok, it's like, do you want to run for office? They're like, why would I do that? That's like, that's where you lose it all. So they all end up in business, you know, and, and what are you left with? And I think that's the point that like, we need to be really careful about that. Like we have to make running for office or climbing up the hierarchy in, in positions of leadership attractive, not just to the power hungry people where they don't have to make a, a cost benefit reward, you know, analysis and think, am I going to have to raise $12 million to run for the Senate? Well, you know, that doesn't sound fun. I mean, I think that is a, it's a very astute point because it's, it's part of this broader point that when you have systems that are unattractive to normal people, you're going to disproportionately attract the people who are drawn to power for the sake of power, which is what I think has happened in the United States. Oh, I'm sure a lot of people agree with you, Ryan. Um, but I, I will say when, when each of these principles came up, I was like, ooh, like there, there's an associated policy. So campaign finance would help. Civic juries would help. And number three, you have rotate to reduce abuse. And you know what that said to me, my friend? Term limits. Let's get them in and get them out. Yeah, so I think I think there is a, a a real benefit to changing the people who are in power regularly. Yup. And I, and I think it's something where you know there's a question that I often wish was asked of politicians, which is, what are, what are you trying to achieve? In other words, what is the thing that if it changed, if you got it, you would think my work here is done. It's time for me to go home. You be on. I don't but continue. <laughs> I, I just I think that's that's something we never frame political discussions around. Like we don't say, you know, what where are you going for? You know, if you're going to go there for four years, what are you hoping to achieve in the four years? When when will you give up power? Uh, and rotation. I mean, we have a lot of evidence that this actually works really really well because it reduces collusion. Uh, you have this, you know, obviously in police forces and banks and so on. Well, what they do is they say, look, if, if you're with the same partner for like 20 years and you're both crooked, that's a very dangerous situation because it means that you're going to protect each other. You'll both sort of take bribes, you'll extort people and so on, and you'll feel comfortable doing it. You got a training day that dude, you got to say to him, Hey, are you cool? Are you cool, Brian? <laughs> 
we have we have lots of evidence that this actually works. And I think the the principle also extends to the idea of of rotation in politics because you get these sort of these chummy clubs, right, where they all think when that oh, member of Congress shows up, they sit them down and are like, "So are you cool? Are you going to be cool?" <laughs> <laughs> just a different uniform it's a suit instead of the uh the badge and the uniform i guess yeah <laughs> oh, oh yeah that, that something like that's definitely going on there's some very very weird corporate orientation going on in um, uh, in, in congress um on multiple levels so um th- so this goes back to your don't see people as abstractions um th- that that's one of your big lessons here is uh create reminders of responsibility um, just to let them know it's like hey if you screw up there are going to be some real consequences you had a very dramatic story in your book about this where when someone becomes prime minister in Britain the first thing you do is be like what are you going to do if there's a nuclear strike and then you have to I, I thought the story was fascinating where you write instructions on a sealed envelope where the person in the nuclear submarine then opens it and to see what you said to do and the trick is that no one knows what you said because everyone has to act like you said, bomb whoever bombed us, so that way no one bombs us. But the real instructions could be, do nothing. Uh, and, and then the other, well, another one was like, so like become uh, a part of the U.S. <laughs> Navy was another one, which I found yeah, really yeah, yeah. fascinating. And then the other choice was do what you want, submarine commander, it is up to you. Yeah, you know, the thing I love about this, so like I know this story because it's now publicly available. Like we know that this is what happens the first time a prime minister, the first day a prime minister takes office is like the 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 first thing they're told is you have to handwrite these letters to the submarine captains if London gets wiped out by a nuclear blast. Now, what's interesting is up until like the last, I think, decade and a half, nobody knew this existed except for the people at the highest echelons of the British government. And what I was trying to say is like, Imagine you've just finished this campaign. You've just won. You're now the prime minister. And the first thing that happens is somebody tells you this and you have no idea it's coming. I mean, the weight of responsibility is going to hit you very, very quickly, particularly during the Cold War. I mean, this would have scared the hell out of people in the 1970s and 80s. And, and I, I think it's, it's, it's too easy sometimes to lose sight uh, of how much uh, power you actually have to change other people's lives. There's a... There's also a, a study that I cite in the book that's it's, it's about this concept called psychological distance. And it's basically saying like, as humans, we triage who we care about. You're gonna care about your family and then your friends and then you know maybe your coworkers, depending on how good they are and so on. And, and you have these different layers that you sort of go out and eventually you're gonna stop caring about people, which is normal. But the problem is that I think we've engineered a society, and I, you know, you've talked about this with automation and so on, where it's getting easier and easier and easier to have more layers of psychological distance between people who are affecting your life and you. And the evidence is very, very clear that the more psychological distance between one person and another, the easier it is to abuse them, to view them as disposable, to start to treat them you know, like they're insignificant. And, you know, you think about the corporate downsizing consultant, the person who sort of got the job of just coming in to fire you because nobody in the corporate you know, corner office actually wants to deal with that. And, you know, I think I think we've created a world that is built for psychological distance, uh, e- even things like drone strikes. You know, uh, I mean, dr- drone strikes create psychological distance more than dude. Uh, social media, with. like people behave social on media. social media in a way they never would in real life. You know, yeah, I mean, I always, I always think about that when I get like these hateful comments on my, on my Twitter. I'm like, nobody has ever said something like this to me in person. And I, you get this like that, twelve that, times. That's a day, why, uh, you know, that's why I'm really pleasant on social media. And then I'm a total dick in real life. Like, it gets you in person. <laughs> I'm gonna be like, I'm going to tell you things you have never heard before, <laughs> to your face. And then on social media, I'm like, you know, like keep going. <laughs> I mean, I'm kidding, but uh, but but when you talk about the psychological distance, uh, th- this is actually one of like the grave dangers of our. And there's so many grave dangers of our time, I and mean, we're we're pretty fucked. But the um, <laughs> but, but, but that there's this erosion of sympathy and empathy, um, and and then there are these. I'm going to say it like kind of performative displays of sympathy and empathy that I don't think uh, amount to the real thing. It's like, you know, uh, like you're, if, if you have a choice between helping someone in real life or like proclaiming on social media how much you give a shit, like tell the world how much I care as opposed to, you know, how you actually tell someone you care is like go out and like do something about it. And 
no one will ever know you did anything about it. That'd be a more genuine expression. Uh, but now we we are replacing uh, action with expression. Well, and, and 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 I think it's also one of those things that intersects with one of those points we made earlier, where there's the performative aspect to it, and there's there's also the aspect of how easily you know systems or constraints or cultures around us can make us worse than we otherwise would be. And we talked about this with power already, but there's a there's a I think my favorite study in the book because it's just sort of like one of those ones that makes you very depressed about how easy it is to manipulate people's behavior is this study where they have these um, these seminary students, you know, they're, they're training to become priests. And they're told to prepare a talk about the Good Samaritan, the parable from the Bible of, you know, helping the person who's in need. And, uh, and, then, and then they're told to go to the next building and to give the sermon, you know, to pra- that they've practiced. What they don't know is that the, the researchers have put like a, a, an actor who's supposed to pretend no. to be gravely injured between the two buildings. And, that, that's uh, some funny shit. Yeah, they, they, well, they create it, it gets, a Good Samaritan gets, moment on the way to give the Good Samaritan lecture, but you're late. Well, this yeah, this is the beauty of it. So a third of the people get told, like, you know, take your time. You've got plenty of time. A third of them are told you're late. You know, it's fine, but go now. And a third are like, it's really important you rush there. And the people who are told they're late mostly stepped over the injured person on the way to give the Good Samaritan talk, right? <laughs> it's like this tiny little tweak in how you frame the problem made priests who are giving a talk about the Good Samaritan walk over another human being in need. And you're just like, wow. I mean, that speaks to the, the sort of malleability of our behavior. We can, we can change it depending on how we structure society, systems, cultures. Tell all that everyone stuff, to chill why. out. There's no rush. <laughs> you get there when yeah, you guess, get there. I guess there. being late is... Be, being late is always one of those dangers. But I, I think the, the broader point is that, you know, these, this is why these conversations about reform are so important because there actually are tweaks that will make a difference. And, and I think that's what the, the, the bottom line is here. Uh, so uh, another principle, focus oversight on the controllers, not the controlled. I think most people would agree with that. Um, and, and it's one of the concerns of today is that we're, we're trying to uh, focus a lot of attention on, on um, folks who are not exactly uh, behind the steering wheel <laughs> in a lot of cases. We've, we've en- you, you say that everybody agrees on this, but we've engineered a society with exactly the opposite principle, right? I mean, it's like in, in pandemic workplaces where you're working from home or whatever, you, there's new technologies that actually some companies have put like sensors in the chairs to make sure that the person's actually sitting there. I mean, it's so dystopian. And, and yet it's not like Enron was brought down by, you know, the person taking a five minute extra long lunch break. It was it was the people who weren't being watched, who were embezzling or, or cooking the books or whatever. And so, you know, my, my point is that with the responsibility of leadership comes extra scrutiny. And, and yet we have a lot of the surveillance mechanisms of modern society trained at the people who can do the least damage. And I think it's very bizarre that we've come up with that system. I mean, it makes sense because the people who are setting up the system don't want to be watched themselves. But, you know, the idea of like keystroke logging for employees, I mean, if you're going to roll that out for the employees, you better roll it out for the CEO too, I think. And that's wow. The, that CEO would veto that shit and be like, what, you're going to monitor my would. keystrokes? That's Screw right. Screw that, Brian. <laughs> Everyone's keystrokes now are anonymized. <laughs> I decree it. Um, I just want to go on the record and say, if I were the incoming prime minister of the UK and I was given that choice, I would uh, write in the envelope that the submarine commanders should do what they think is best because I feel like they can process the situation. They can get new information. uh, They can see what the most appropriate action is. I mean, you've given someone control of a nuclear submarine. Like you, you have to kind of assume that they have a pretty good head on their shoulders. They're commanding, you'd assume, also dozens of people uh, under seas for a length of time. So anyway, just wanted to suggest that that would be my move. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, it just seemed like the best choice to me. Um, the, there, I'm going to tell a story now about your next principle, um, which is you say to utilize randomness to uh, increase security with 
uh, minimal invasion of privacy. And I'm just going to tell a quick story. I was a camp counselor at a camp for, uh, you know, maybe like 12 year olds, 13 year olds, something like that. I was 19 or 20. Um, and so the deal was that uh, I was on duty every other night, um, but the campers didn't know which was which. Um, you know, like I, I was on duty for half an hour after lights out every night, but then every other night I could do whatever the hell I wanted after that time. Um, and so me and whoever was off duty would go out and like go to TGI Fridays and get some drinks and the rest of it. Um, but I just remember what an effective deterrent it was because to the kids, it was like I was always there. Like, <laughs> like, like they, didn't, they didn't know I had every, every other night off. Um, so like that, like I, I love the idea of like, like, look, you just need to insert some randomness in there and just introduce the possibility that someone could be there. And then all of a sudden be, people's behavior will improve. Yeah, so so the, the I, I love that story because it it jives really well with the one that I talk about in the book, which is the um, the conversation I had with the former head of internal affairs at NYPD, and he set up these drug stings where you know they've got they tell this guy to like go and babysit to crime scene where there's you know a ton of cocaine on the table and twenty thousand dollars in cash, but nobody's been there, so they see what he does. They, you know, does he pocket six grand and then report? that he seized $14,000. What's amazing about that story though, is that they have 500 of these they do. They do 500 sting operations. Then they survey the cops and they say, how many of you were subject to a sting in the last year? And 12,000 cops say they were subject to a sting. And the reason for that is because if you put out 500, some of those people are actually going to encounter real situations where there's drugs on the table and money on the table, and they're gonna think it's a sting. And it starts to create this sort of impression of like, maybe this is just a setup and there's some sort of healthy dose of, of sense of, you know, potential consequences. The, the really funny thing about that study though, is they, they had, um, they had like people, which it's an amazing job. You can imagine the NYPD, they had people like go up to cops and try to like provoke them to punching them. So they would like, they would like insult them. The sting, and of course, if the, cop, the insulting yeah, pedestrian sting. It's it's right and like and if they if they punch the pedestrian, uh, they would you know face consequences or get fired or whatever, and and it's just like, but the value of this is that because it was random, the effect of it was much much higher than if if they'd actually said you know oh we're gonna do fifty sting operations this year because then the uncertainty doesn't exist now. I don't want to live in a dystopian society where like the the break room fridge is like baited, you know, to see who's going to take the, the the sandwich. But I think for people who are in immense positions of you know positions of immense authority or positions that are prone to abuse, that the occasional threat of random oversight is very very effective. I've got it. Members of Congress just get offered money at random, and then <laughs> in some cases it's like busted. And so then when members of Congress get offered stuff, they'd be like, oh, I can't take this. Huh? Am I fixing things? Well, I, you know, I don't actually think that's like the stupidest idea. I think that there's something, I think there's something to the, so in the UK right now, there's this sleaze scandal, they call it, where lo and behold, the people who got the contracts for a lot of the COVID services of testing and so on happened to be people that were friends with some of the ministers. You know, I don't actually think it would be that bad of a thing to occasionally plant, you know, fake contractors. Oh, I, I'm into it. We should, I, I, I wasn't really kidding. We should totally just yeah. have like freaking fake, uh, <laughs> fake real estate deals and other garbage in there. You know, fake stock market tips, fake <laughs> pandemics. Be like, hey, oh you know, and then see if they buy Zoom stock. And then you're like, busted. <laughs> Um, this pandemic wasn't real. The last three were. So, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I mean, these the systems would be very, very helpful. I mean, a, a lot of them spoke to me as very consistent with human behavior. Uh, and a lot of them, you can actually try and marry a political reform to. Um, I'm going to close with your last uh, principle, which I thought was very, very powerful and correct, which is, Stop waiting for principled saviors, make them instead. And uh, this is really the point of your book is that, look, you have people, you have incentives and systems, and uh, if you're waiting for Superman to come along, then you know it's probably not going to happen. And oh, by the way, Superman probably couldn't fix this shit anyway. Um, so what you need to do is you need to try and actually make the system attractive 
and uh, the kind of system that will attract and empower the right people. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the this is the ultimate answer to these problems that we've all identified. I mean, we're unhappy with our leadership class. We're unhappy with the people who are seeking and obtaining power. So why don't we do anything about it? You know, I mean, we can we can just Too wait hard. and hope and yeah, exactly. <laughs> So we, I mean, we could we could wait and hope that there's going to be some massive, uh, you know, wave of good leaders that just sort of stumble upon our lives and and fix everything. That would be great if that happened. But I think we need to think very very carefully about how you engineer systems to ensure that those people end up in power. And you know, what I've been baffled by is like, why don't we have that conversation? Like, we always have. It's our media, brother. Our media doesn't give a shit about what you're talking about. Our media just wants to piss us off about the, the, the person's wrong action or wrong statement of the day. And then we can decide who to get mad at tomorrow, who to get mad at the next day. Um, you know, our, our media just whipsaws people and their sentiments. Um, and a corrupt system doesn't make good cable news. Well, that's what I call like the tip of the iceberg problem, which is like you've got this whole phenomenon around power, the systems, the people who don't obtain it under the surface. The tip of the iceberg is the people who are in power. And it it makes sense to focus on them. They're visible. they, They matter. You might crash into them. But I think that that's all we focus on. You know, we don't think about the the system and the people who aren't making it into power, the introverts, the 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 different you know candidates who couldn't possibly win office because they don't have twelve million dollars in the bank. You know this, and, and and I think this is where smart reforms can make a better world. I think that's the the really important take, and it's where I you know see eye to eye with 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 a lot of what you're doing is. This is something where we can change it. We, we're, we're not like beholden to a world where we just think our leaders are corrupt and bad and self-interested and narcissistic. You get the, you get the people that you have a system made for. You know, a rotten system attracts rotten people. A good system attracts good people. And our system is, is rotten. So the, the answer isn't to just sort of berate the people who end up there. It makes sense. We're going to do that anyway. It's to actually make the system good so that we don't have to do that in the end. And I think that's the ultimate uh, answer to this, this big problem of how power corrupts people and how corruptible people get power. I agree with you 100%. We need to focus on the mechanics of the system, the incentives it produces. Uh, it, it's why I'm doing the work that I'm doing, which is trying to diminish the power of the extremes, empower the reasonable, somewhat silent majority. Uh, yeah, so it's one reason why I enjoyed your book so much. I am going to suggest something to you that, you know, it, it's something that troubles me, and that this will be our closing note. Like, right now, the, the system is rotten. It attracts rotten people. It makes reasonable people less reasonable over time and more rotten. Um, and, and now there's this real dubiousness where if someone comes along, um, we just want to tear them down. And, and I will say that right now the media is very much animated by this energy. It's like, what, someone's trying to do something? Like, let's try and shiv that person in some way. Uh, and because, you know, they have to be corrupt. And so we, we're going to show how corrupt they are. And this, by the way, is one of the things that's dissuading a number of, in my view, pretty good people from doing something like running for office is because they know that to the extent they have any foibles or dirty laundry, it's going to get dragged out for all to see. You do have an environment where, you know, there was a a woman, Alexi Hammond, who tweeted something that people didn't like when she was a minor. I think she was like 17 and then she like loses her job over that. Um, and, And so like in that environment... Uh, it's one of the concerns I have, frankly, is like, so you have this rotten system, you have this churn, and then if someone comes in, now there's this impulse, it's like, oh, like, let's let's tear this person down, what's wrong with them, what's wrong with them? Uh, and so you have this increasingly inchoate mess where uh, that your trust just gets uh, lower and lower. Um, so I, I suppose I'm doubling down in your case where this, cha- this sort of change is very, very much overdue because it's contributing to the loss of trust. You know, this is something that I grappled with, uh, grappled with a lot when I was writing the book because, as I said before, I, I sat down with some really unpalatable, pe- unpalatable people. But people are really complicated. You know, I, I wish that we could have that conversation where it's just like there's no uniformly virtuous person and no uniformly evil person for the most part in our society. Not a shades of gray. We're- yeah, and and I think this is something where you can have that grown up conversation. You can say, look, 
we're not looking for a saint. We're looking for someone who's going to make the world better. And that's something that I think is is a, a really important recognition because otherwise you have a sort of random effect too, right? Like randomly somebody who has a a terrible view when they're 16 years old happens to tweet it. Somebody who's 16 years old doesn't tweet it, says it to their friend, and one of them gets destroyed and one doesn't. I mean, that's 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 randomness, right? And it's it's something where I think we don't want to engineer systems where we insist upon 100% mistake-free leadership. I think that also people who make mistakes learn from the, those mistakes. So to me, you know, I, I grapple with this and how I wrote about people who I don't admire because some of the people in the book that I sat down with, I think, did some really vile stuff. But I was trying to con- convey that they're they're dealing with different pressures, they're talking to uh, different systems, they're navigating, uh, you know, a culture of power that's different from ours, and maybe we would behave similarly if we were thrust into that position. But instead, what we t- like to do is say, oh, they're bad, we're good. You know, and I, I think there's something much more complicated going on where it would be better for us as a society if we didn't want to have somebody who was 100% perfect, but instead was working hard to make a system better for the rest of us, because that's ultimately what the goal of politics and power should be. I love it. I'm going to suggest a litmus test for that person, Brian. Just term limits. Uh, 74% of Americans are for term limits. If you just said, hey, who's for term limits? Just most Americans instinctively sense it's a good thing. Uh, it would really help a lot of the problems you're describing. I, I'm going to suggest that could be one litmus test. Uh, and that, that's something I've been for since the presidential. It's like, look, let's have term limits. Um, and I would certainly feel the same way if I were in office because I would be thinking, let me get done what I can get done and then get the heck out of the way and let the next person go. <laughs> that's a, so I, I'm just going to suggest that as a potential um, starting point that could activate a lot of people and, and give you a sense as to what's motivating a particular leader. Yeah, and, and I think these these reforms have to happen in tandem because if you have refor- if you have term limits but you don't have campaign finance reform, you will have some people who end up you know sort of taking the money and run so to speak. They they figure they're they're about to be out of office, so they'll just do whatever the lobbyists say. Which is why I think you have to have lots of reforms at once. I think yeah, that, you need the sting operations, you need the campaign finance reform, you need them all. Yeah, and, and I, in tandem, I know they, they I know work. exactly who to put in charge of everything. Brian Class, anti-corruption czar. <laughs> and then what we do is we give you a helmet with like, uh, you know, some, some weird insignia on it. And then say, if any of you are corrupt, Brian, the incorruptible, will come <laughs> and chastise you and call you out. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think that's a terrible idea. I think that uh, I would not, I, I don't think I would make a, a particularly good president. But it's Class, uh, the incorruptible. <laughs> uh, that's going to be the, the sequel to your book, which I did enjoy a great deal. I think it was very, very interesting and profound and correct. Corruptible, who gets power and how it changes us. Brian Class, congratulations on this, man. It's a, it's a great book, uh, really fascinating, profound, and, and I hope a lot of people read it and want to apply its lessons. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's a pleasure to talk to you. 